Hello, and welcome to the RAIC Corporate Affiliate Series. My name is Pamela Burke, and I am the Education Administrator at the RAIC. Our corporate affiliate for today's webinar is Designable Environments, Inc. Designable Environments, Inc. is one of Canada's oldest and leading consulting firms that provides expertise to public and private sector clients on how to design the built environment to meet the needs of all people, including persons with disabilities and the elderly. DE has been instrumental in developing and popularizing the philosophies of both barrier-free and universal design. DE's staff work within project teams to ensure that team members gain a true understanding of the complexities challenges and opportunities associated with accessibility. DE has extensive track record as accessibility consultants on local and international projects, including residential, commercial, educational, judicial, recreational, institutional, and healthcare projects. DE is skilled in the interpretation and application of a variety of accessibility standards and best practices to provide supportive built environments that promote independence, dignity, and safety for all. For more information, please visit www.designable.ca. Today's presentation is titled Accessibility in Urban Planning and is being presented by Thea Curdy. A few additional points of information before we begin. You are welcome to ask questions throughout the session via the chat feature on your screen. These will be collected and given to the presenter at the end of the session, at which time they will be answered. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat feature to inform us. Lastly, please be sure to complete the post-event survey which will be sent within a few days of the webinar. RAIC members are eligible for a certificate of attendance. Completion of the survey is required before the certificate will be issued. And now, today's presentation. Welcome everyone. This is the webinar for the RAIC Corporate Affiliate Series for December 4th. The title of this webinar is Designing for the Future, Accessibility in Urban Planning. Today, we're gonna to be covering five different topics in our agenda. First, we'll be doing an introduction. Second, we'll be doing a background on accessibility, which will include why bother, understanding accessibility legislation, what is disability, and accessibility for a diverse population. Number three, we'll be talking about accessibility in urban planning, where the meat and potatoes of this presentation is. Number four, we'll be doing accessibility in the 15 minute city because so many people are talking about it. And then of course, we're gonna finish off with resources. So we'll start with just really briefly, who am I and why am I talking to you about this topic? My name is Thea Curdy. I'm the Vice President at Designable Environments, one of Canada's oldest accessibility and universal design firms. In fact, we've been in business for the last 33 years, giving us a depth and breadth of experience that most other firms unfortunately haven't had the chance to experience yet. We do all kinds of work, including master planning, feasibility studies, drawing reviews with architects and design teams, building audits, creating accessibility standards for every level of government and large organizations, as well as research and education. I'm proud to be on the board of directors for both the Universal Design Network of Canada and Arts Build Ontario. And now I'm regularly doing a monthly segment on AMI radio and television with the Now with Dave Brown show. If you follow me on social media, you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. 
as well as designable environments. Obviously with LinkedIn, we can give you more information because it doesn't have the character limits that Twitter does. So please check us out there and see all of the things that we are up to on a regular basis and resources that we like to share with our clients. Let's start by doing a quick review of the learning outcomes for today's webinar. As a conclusion of this session, participants will be able to do four separate things. One, identify population demographics of people needing accessibility. Two, recognize the impacts of the built environment and accessibility legislation on accurately defining the design parameters to include disabled people. And three, integrate inclusive design in public spaces to develop holistic accessibility. And finally, four, recognize the impact of urban planning on the social and economic opportunities of people and the unintended consequences on our society. There are other accessibility learning opportunities coming your way. In fact, as a part of this urban planning series for the month of December, there's a second session that we'll be holding on December 11th called Accessible Site Plans in an Urban Landscape. This will be expanding on many site-specific topics introduced during this presentation. The second opportunity is a wonderful new course created by the REIC leadership called Introduction to Successful Accessible Design Course. It's available to you at the REIC website. We have listed here at reic.org slash accessible design. And this course is available for both CEU and graduate level credits. We'll hope you sign up. Okay, so back to our agenda. Let's now move to the background on accessibility. And that means we're gonna start with the why bother question. So first, let's have a look at demographics because demographics leads a lot of change. If you're trying to figure out why do we need to do something, we often look at how much of a need is there. So if we look at the Canadian population and the distribution by age group shown here in a pie chart, where the zero to 19 age group is shown in blue, in 2016, 22% of the population was in that age group. The age group of 20 to 64, shown here in a rusty red color, again in 2016, was 62% of the population. And finally, those 65 and older, shown here in a light green, is, has, was in 2016, 17%. So now if we jump ahead to see where are we going and where does our urban environment need to help make sure that we are prepared for? Let's have a look at where we are for 2030. So if I go back to 20, sorry, if I go back to 2016 and then go forward again, we can see that the pie chart has changed. Again, in the zero to 19 blue category here in the top right of the pie chart, we see 21% of the population in 2030 will be in that age group. But we also see that from the 20 to 64 age group in the rust color at the bottom of the pie chart, we see in 2030, this number has dropped to 55%, which means in 2030, 60, people 65 and older will make up 23% of the population across Canada. Obviously there are regional differences to this. And in places that are popular with retirees, that number is going to be quite a bit larger. So something to be very sensitive to and obviously something we can prepare for if we're thinking about it now. And one of the reasons we have to think about this is when we spend so much time thinking about the different uh, minority groups that we have, in fact, the Canadian Survey on Disability, which covered Canadians between the ages of 15 and over, when they were asked in the study that was done in 2017, 22% of them reported having at least one type of disability. And at the time that rep represented 6.2 million people from that age category. Now those numbers are quite low in fact, because if you think about it, if you're asking people to self-identify, there will be a, a number of people who don't self-identify for all kinds of reasons. And often you'll hear us talking about universal design or what's sometimes called the curb cut effect. 
when curb cuts were first installed, we were thinking about them for people with wheelchair or mobility disability assisted aids, but in fact, it helped a lot more people. Here's a graphic that we have or found from the Microsoft Accessibility Toolkit group talking, obviously they were focusing more on software, but it works equally as well for the built environments. And what we see are three columns identified as permanent, temporary and situational different types of disabilities. And we have two pictures here, one on the left that deals with touch disabilities, sight disabilities, and the one on the right deals with hearing disabilities and speech disabilities. So for example, if we were only thinking about people with permanent disabilities, which is typically where that self-reporting number tends to come from, then we might only, if we were thinking about touch for permanent, only be thinking about perhaps somebody who has one arm, an amputee, or someone who is born with one arm, only one arm. Um, but we're not necessarily considering the people who have temporary disabilities. Um, and for example, here, we're showing someone with an arm injury in, with their arm in a sling or a situational disability like a parent who's carrying a child who may in holding that child only have access to one hand at a time. Moving on to sight, if we thought about permanent disabilities, of course, we typically think of people who are blind. If we thought about temporary disabilities, we could think about somebody with a cataract as shown here or for example, when I get my hay fever in the spring and my eyes are watering, I can have difficulty seeing. But from a situational perspective, we could all be a distracted driver from time to time. Moving now to the picture on the right, if we think about hearing disability and look at the permanent types of disabilities, of course, we typically think of people who are deaf. But for temporary disabilities, we could think about someone who has an ear infection, in situational disabilities, we could think of somebody like a bartender who's in a, uh, a noisy bar or people at a dance club with lots of loud music. If we were thinking about speech disability, from a permanent disability perspective, we could think of someone who's nonverbal. From a temporary disability, we could think about somebody with laryngitis. But situationally, we could also have somebody who has a heavy accent and is hard to understand or is having a hard time understanding us. So for a number of reasons, the type of accommodations we're providing for people with disabilities often benefit a much larger group of people. All right, so let's have a look now at understanding our accessibility legislation. Change is coming here in Canada. For the very first time, we have a Minister of Persons with Disabilities. Her name is Carla Qualtro. And uh, she is in charge of the new Accessible Canada Act. In Ontario and many other provinces, they also have a Minister of Accessibility. In Ontario, that's Minister Raymond Cho. This type of leadership helps to signal what's happening, what the priorities for the government are, and how they're achieving the laws that we have here in Canada and the international agreements we've made. So for example, a lot of people are unaware that our laws related to accessibility and uh, human rights are actually uh, set up in a hierarchy. So the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was passed over 28 years ago. It is the highest law that we have. Underneath that, we have our human rights codes. Now, and the Canadian Human Rights Code was changed almost immediately after the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, but in many provinces, it was changed shortly thereafter. And then we see beneath that in the hierarchy, our building code, which could include the national building code as many provinces and territories follow, or your local provincial code, as we have, for example, in Ontario. Um, this could also is also in line with, uh, at the federal level, the Accessible Canada Act. Uh, at the provincial level, if you're in Ontario or Manitoba, or now Nova Scotia, um, you might have an Accessibility Act on its own. So in Ontario, you have the Ontario, Ontarians with, um, sorry, <laughs> the AODA, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. So when you're following the building code and you're following the AODA or your provincial accessibility requirements, that doesn't remove the responsibility for achieving the human rights code. And if you're thinking about urban planning, 
we have to think about the context of these legislation. So what we have here in this picture is showing how the Ontario Human Rights Code surrounds us. It's the higher or superseding code. Uh, in Ontario, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act informs, and we see here two circles on the left around site development, it informs the Integrated Accessible Standards Regulation. That's where we have the standards telling us what the AODA requires, but it also feeds into the Planning Act. The Integrated Accessibility Standards Regulation feeds into the AODA's Design of Public Spaces Standard, which has a relationship then both to the municipal bylaws and into building development. The Planning Act feeds into municipal bylaws as well. Now looking at the right hand side in the building development, we can see that the AODA feeds into the Building Code Act. There's a relationship between those two pieces of legislation. And the Building Code Act obviously is where the Ontario Building Code comes from. And again, we see the relationship between the building code reflected back to the design of public spaces standard. So this type of complexity is something that many people don't understand and don't understand the liability risks they have, unfortunately, because the AODA design of public spaces and the Ontario building code are not specific enough to meet the needs of the human rights code, which says we will not discriminate against people with disabilities. That's why this type of presentation and the other educational opportunities being offered by the REIC are all the more important. So when we're looking at what prevents disabled people accessing public spaces and attractions, we see here a diagram that was put together uh, representing the types of complaints that come out of the human rights complaint um, forums. Um, when we look at human rights uh, complaints, we see 44% of the disability issues are around moving around the building. 23% um, are inadequate lifts or elevators. 22% um, is about the entrances. 21% is about parking. And then we have bathrooms, footpath design, transport, and lack of assistance. So when we're looking at the types of complaints that are coming in, many of these fall into the urban planning um, uh, provisions and could be solved by careful and thoughtful design. Again, I mentioned earlier, we have international agreements. Canada is one of the signatories to the UN's Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And we signed the convention in 2010. We also signed what's called the optional protocol and the optional protocol is oversight from the UN, and we signed that in 2018. So the UN is now checking in with us to make sure that we are actually implementing the Conventions of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Everybody's excited about sustainability these days, aren't they? The Sustainable Development Goals, also known as SDGs, actually have integrated within them a great deal about accessibility and accommodations for people with disabilities. Here you see the screenshot from their website so that you can do a quick Google search, find this information and see how these two issues that most people don't think of together are actually quite interrelated. Also, if you're in urban planning, you're well aware of the new urban agenda. And here we can see in the UN's Habitat 3 that they have a vision of cities for all people. They're talking about generations without discrimination of any kind. They're talking about accessible, healthy, affordable, sustainable cities. They're looking for the quality of life. They want to be promoting the housing sector, building codes, standards, planning regulations, focusing on affordability, health, safety, and accessibility. So obviously these documents that we're using in so many other ways pertain and support accessibility outcomes. And then finally, the WHO actually has a global age-friendly cities guide because an age-friendly city is something that you can get a designation for. So many cities are looking as they want to market themselves as being a place that people could retire to. Um, they are often looking at these types of designations for their city. And this is a free guide that's available to you as well. All right, let's now transition into what exactly is a disability? Well, understandably, the international symbol of disability 
is a wheelchair. And in fact, if you've ever thought that this diagram looks awkward, it is. It was originally designed actually just as a wheelchair. And when so many people complain about it, instead of actually designing it properly, they just put a head on the wheelchair. So this static immobile um, image, unfortunately focuses a lot of people's attention on wheelchair users, but it also tends to focus the idea that people with disabilities or mobility disabilities are quite helpless. So we've seen an absence of thinking about blindness and low vision. Although we were already thinking about mobility disabilities, we weren't thinking about brain injuries, people who are deaf, deafened or hard of hearing, people who have learning disabilities, people who have attention deficit or hyperactive disorders, neuroatypical or autism, people who are amputees, people who have arthritis, people who have a speech and language disabilities, disabilities caused by aging. In fact, 70% of disabilities are what we call invisible. I have several invisible disabilities, which means that you can't tell by just looking at me that I have disabilities. So for some examples of this, these are not my disabilities, but some examples might be particular medications that could make you dizzy or environmental sensitivities where we see in green design a great deal of conversation around internal air quality. And now of course with COVID that's becoming an issue as well. But I think when we really want to understand the experience of our environment, it's best to listen to people with the lived experience. People with disabilities themselves are telling us our built environments are failing them terribly. In fact, it's not uncommon for me to see comments like we see here, a tweet um, that was published by Kelsey Acton that says, I think the thing non-disabled people don't get is that it's never just one time or one thing. The hard part of inaccessibility is crushing unrelentlessness of it. I, it's not uncommon for me to go to conferences or be speaking in consultation with people with disabilities and have them shockingly tell us that they often feel like this place hates me. It's not that the person behind the design didn't like them, although that's often the second conclusion, but just feeling so rejected by the place. I'm not welcome here. They don't want me here. It's surprising how often that happens. And I think most people that I work with, our clients are shocked to hear that that's not the intended outcome they want and they want to be doing better and we can do better. In fact, if we thought about it, instead of classifying people as non-disabled and disabled, if we actually thought about ourselves and our whole lifetime of changing needs abilities, who we were 20 years ago, who we're going to be in 20 years, what our parents have, how our parents have changed or our grandparents have changed. And thinking about, as we mentioned before, temporary disabilities, this image sh shows a lifetime of different ages and different abilities that a person might experience and the different uh, assistive equipment they may need. So we went going from a crawling infant all the way to older age and the use of uh, visible assistive devices but also thinking about any one of these characters in this uh, silhouette could have invisible disabilities. All right, let's finish up the background on accessibility with accessibility for a diverse population. So again, challenging the idea that people with disabilities or disabled people are only thinking about people with using wheelchairs, we often forget to think about how we could be accommodating people who are using support services or support animals. <clears throat> so if you have a person with a support person, then having segregated seating with no companion seating immediately adjacent to it's gonna be a problem. In fact, the need for support animals is so great. If you're following this at all, you'll often see appeals online. Is uh, In the States, they've started using small ponies to try to help people get around. So instead of a guide dog, you would have a guide pony. But we're also seeing dogs used for all other kinds of things. We're seeing them used as emotional support animals. We're seeing them used for people who have hearing loss, people who have diabetes, people who have epilepsy, um, or quadriplegics have people using monkeys because monkeys can get to places that dogs can't. So what kind of accommodations do we need to be thinking about instead of thinking, we can't do that or that we haven't done that before, how could we problem solve to support the needs for people?
And when we do think about wheelchairs, what kind of wheelchairs are we thinking about? So in this picture here, we're seeing two pictures of people who are overweight. And unfortunately, our population, and in many regions of Canada, our population are rapidly becoming much larger people. And that means their wheelchairs are going to be much larger. So we can see in the picture on the left, a gentleman in a singing competition who was over 400 pounds, he had to be lifted up onto the stage. Uh, his wheelchair was so wide that the temporary ramp that they had was not wide enough for his equipment. The uh, gentleman we see on the right is on an oversized or large size scooter, uh, much larger in dimensions than a typical scooter. And unfortunately, our legislation doesn't even size for regular scooters. So again, thinking about how do we accommodate the changes that are happening in our society? How could we better accommodate them? We have to be thinking about the equipment as well. And unfortunately, many people with disabilities become homeless because our um, housing is not accessible. Um, how many shelters are accessible? How many services are accessible? Unfortunately, we are seeing this as an explosion um, in the homeless population uh, and the accommodations that we could be providing, which are pretty easy to include, haven't yet been considered because people aren't thinking about it. And then of course, there's kids with disabilities. So if you were born with a disability or through illness or accident or aging, any one of us could get a disability. But kids with disabilities don't know that they have disabilities. And how are we accommodating them or leaving them out? That's partially a tragedy when we don't have accessible housing and think about Halloween, how many kids can't come to Halloween or participate in Halloween um, because our houses always have steps at the front. All right, so let's move on to some examples of some things I can take you through that will help improve urban planning for everybody. Here's a list of 12 different things that we'll be talking about. And hopefully if you wanna take a screenshot, you can do that now. But we wanna talk about signage and wayfinding, accessible seating, defensive architecture, bike storage, amenity zones, construction obstructions, charging stations, on-street parking, snow clearing, and then we wanted to also touch on impacts from COVID-19. What about waiting outside, outdoor dining, preserving the path of travel, COVID signage and directional arrows, and then moving on from there to exterior site maintenance and transportation. So lots of things to consider. This is a, actually not a complete list, but it's what we wanted to try to get through to get um, us headed in the right direction anyway. So first, let's have a look at signage and wayfinding. Here we see a picture in downtown Toronto of one of these new wayfinding maps that they have positioned here. But if we look at the signage and ask ourselves, there are five questions here on the right-hand side, how would you find the map itself if you couldn't see or if you couldn't see well? What size is the text related to the viewing distance? How close would you have to be to see it? And is the text at the right height if you couldn't see that far in front of your face? What kind of tactile or braille elements are included or not included? And if they're not included, has an audio headphone jack been provided for people who um, can't read, who could plug in and listen instead? And then the finish on it, if it doesn't have a matte finish, is the glare gonna cause a problem depending on the time of day and the sun shining on it? So lots of things to consider that often are forgotten. Here we see a picture that I took when I was in Brisbane in Australia. And at the corner, they not only have braille on the push to cross button, but just above the push to cross button, they have uh, tactile and braille identifying the street that you're crossing and the addresses on that block. That's really great. And when you're doing this type of signage, you've got to think about what type of font you're using. And in this case, the accessible font type is a sans serif. You need color contrast. You need to have the braille. You need to have the appropriate height from the ground or the floor. If you're gonna provide maps, make sure the maps themselves are tactile. And then of course the shape. So as great as this is, because they're using vertical text, this would be a barrier for some people. So it's, it's a really good start, but it hasn't necessarily checked all the boxes, but it was impressive to see. This is a photo I took in Korea. 
Now, one of the things we're seeing a lot of in urban planning is dropped curbs at intersections. And one of the difficulties with dropped curbs, uh, particularly if you're in Ontario or Manitoba, is that the AODA requires the crosswalks to be directional, which makes sense because if you're blind, you can't see where you're headed. And if the dropped curb doesn't have a tactile directional wayfinding like we see here um, to help orient you to how to cross the street safely and get to the other side, you could see where somebody may accidentally walk out into traffic. So that's not safe. We wanna be using these types of strategies that we're seeing in many places around the world. I saw this also in Australia and New Zealand, and I've also seen it in um, Europe as well. Here we have uh, signage, more signage and wayfinding, again, using tactile directional um, tiles that crosses the sidewalk. So as you're walking down the sidewalk, perpendicular to your path of travel, you have tactile directional wayfinding that leads to the bus stop signage. And the bus stop signage, although I didn't get a close up picture here, also includes braille and large size text, as well as a headphone jack so that you can, again, get more information. So how would you find the bus stops if you couldn't see? Or if you're disoriented, it's a great way for people who are you know, a little overwhelmed in a new city to find the bus stops themselves. Here we see a new hospital that's considering how do people get from the drop-off area or the bus stop and use tactile directional wayfinding to help lead them to the accessible entrance. So we see the light gray pavement and then the dark gray tactile directional indicator pavers leading past the drop-off area, past the bus stop. So as you get out, you can follow them to the entrance. Now, moving on to accessible seating. As we think about people aging or people who may have fatigue issues or other types of disabilities, seating is becoming a larger issue for our aging population in particular. And here we see a really good example um, in uh, downtown Mississauga, right near the lake in Port Credit, where we see that the seating is immediately adjacent to the path of travel, but not blocking it. And each of the benches is color contrasted and actually has a different texture and a different color material to the sidewalk it's sitting next to. And there's clear floor space beside each of each end of the bench. So a person who's using a wheeled mobility device or if somebody, a parent has a stroller, they can position them immediately next to the bench. What we also often see in cities now is something called defensive architecture. And if we're gonna think about seating, we also often see methods to try to stop people from laying down or sitting on these natural ledges. So we see a picture here where we have a raised planter bed and somebody thought, no, we don't wanna let people sit here. So they put something that's very uncomfortable, a metal, uneven structure with lots of points on it so that people won't be hanging around. Or they provide benches with more um, armrests. Now, more armrests typically can help people stand up as you'll see, but how are the armrests designed and how are they spaced? And particularly with COVID and with people being homeless, how do we balance the need for people to have a place to rest as well as uh, keeping all of the other people working as well. Bike storage is a big issue. We see more and more people, particularly during COVID, turning to using bikes rather than getting on buses or transit. And the mistakes we see here, the picture on the left is vertical storage. Now, if you think about uh, if you're biking, you might have pretty strong legs, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have good upper body strength. And this type of vertical parking unfortunately requires you to be able to lift your bike up. So this would not be accessible for people. On the right hand side, we're also seeing bike lockers. And I have a question mark next to this one because it very much depends on the handle for the bike mark uh, locker, the way the controls or the locks work. Um, access to these bike lockers can be a great accessible option, but you have to be careful. It is horizontal, which is important for accessibility. But again, it could be ruined with just some unfortunate bad decisions. Now we're gonna talk about amenity zones. One of the biggest things we're seeing again with the idea of walkability is the idea that perhaps we should be closing some of our streets and just opening them up entirely to people walking. And this is creating large pedestrian areas which are you know, great for people getting around. But from an accessibility standpoint,
this can be a huge problem. We can get all kinds of conflicts. It can be difficult for people to navigate through. We may not be able to have the seating in an area that's separated from um, the walking area. It may be difficult to do the wayfinding we were talking about. So this has to be approached with caution, not hard to do and make accessible, but we do have to pay attention and think our way through. What if I was deaf and I couldn't hear bikes? What if I was blind and I couldn't see the or follow uh, the path along this open area? Uh, if I have uh, um, fatigue issues, I'm going to need to be able to rest fairly regularly. Is there room to do that? Is it organized in a way that makes sense and is consistent? Thinking about construction, I often work on projects where people are saying, well, yes, temporarily during this phase, we're going to have construction and it may block the sidewalks. Well, again, if you're in Ontario or Manitoba and soon in Nova Scotia, you're going to see the accessible acts um, actually require that you provide accessible alternatives or information for people so that they're not traveling along the sidewalk and then suddenly encounter a sign like this that says sidewalk closed, use other side but they're not at the, an intersection. Or if there is a place to get down onto the road, they forgot to put a curb cut to get down onto the road from. So there's all kinds of issues. It's not a temporary thing when we're doing construction. It's often there for, even if it's only there for a month, but if you think about it, they're often there for a couple of years. So much better planning is needed for this. Again, not hard, just plan for it. This is a new development. This is a picture of Sarnia, Ontario where they have, as a part of their urban planning, started to create areas around their facilities where people can charge the mobility devices or their oxygen devices or their medical assistance devices or whatever it else it is that they need. If you have a cell phone, you've probably been out in the world thinking, I need to charge my cell phone, where could I do this? Well, this is thinking about the specific accommodations for people with motorized wheelchairs, motorized scooters and other facilities. So. This is a great innovation and something I hope to be seeing a lot more of. On-street parking. On-street parking is often a part of the uh, provincial standards, but it's not detailed in our building code. So how do we make on-street parking accessible? Well, we have to be thinking about the size of the space. The, um, how would somebody get out of the vehicle? If they're a passenger and they have a side exit, they're probably exiting fine onto the street. But is there an amenity zone that's blocking that access? If they have a rear exit to their vehicle, then they're gonna to need to have the clear floor space at the back of the vehicle, which means they're gonna to have to have some sort of access aisle back there. And that access aisle will have to be connected to a curb cut onto the sidewalk. Is the sidewalk wide enough to accommodate the curb cut without becoming an obstruction to people who are walking along the sidewalk? And then of course, parking pay machines, where are they located close to the parking? If it's a pay and display system, how easy is it for people to get to the pay machine and then get back to their vehicle to place it onto their dashboard? People with disabilities can drive. Lots of people with mobility disabilities drive modified vehicles. So it's not just a passenger consideration. This could also be a driver who's driving independently and alone. And then of course, thinking seasonally, um, we have a picture here of the types of snowbanks we see beside parking um, along our, particularly our ma major streets and cities where we get these huge deep snowbanks. So even if you had all everything you needed for the size of the actual uh, parking space on the street, this would be blocking the curb ramp to get onto the sidewalk and certainly, as you can see here, blocking the pay machine. And then thinking about outdoor parking, uh, often we see people with disabilities not having plowed parking spaces. So people with disabilities often feel like I can't go out in the winter, uh, not because I can't get around, but because the facilities are not, not being taken care of. So here's a picture of a parking spot. Uh, and, and this is actually pretty good because there hasn't been a lot of snow, but they plowed the rest of the parking spot, but not the accessible parking. Unfortunately, all too common. This is a, a policy fix. The other type of problem we see is much worse where they dump all of the snow into the accessible parking space. So part of the planning for parking needs to include uh, snow, snow storage areas away from the accessible parking for sure. If we think about accessibility and how our world has changed in COVID-19, 
we have three pictures here showing us different conditions that we are now facing. The first picture in the top left is people lining up waiting for their turn to get into a grocery store. They're standing in line with a grocery cart, uh, cart between each of the users and they're waiting outside. You can see actually in this picture there are puddles. So the weather here perhaps has been raining. And again, from an accessibility standpoint, how long am I standing outside? Now as we're approaching the winter, these are all things we need to be thinking about as we're designing and as we're allowing if we have shared space, if people are lining up outside of a store, if there are other people trying to get past, is the sidewalk wide enough to accommodate those people? On the far left of the picture, we see a woman who's trying to join the line and there's no room for her to do so on the sidewalk. So she's now um, on the uh, driveway itself, which is obviously a more dangerous position. The picture in the bottom left is looking at cafes that have moved their tables outside of the restaurants to try to keep people safe. Outdoor dining was allowed in many of our municipalities. But unfortunately, when those ordinances were put together, they weren't thinking about the accessibility of the sidewalk that they were now taking over with the tables. So by accommodating the restaurants, they were creating a maze or a mess or a complete barrier for people with disabilities to access. If they put the tables down onto the roadway, they often weren't thinking about how um, disabled staff or disabled uh, restaurant uh, users were actually gonna get down to that surface. And on the right hand side, we see all kinds of signage that's being put up, paper signage that says, please read this before entering. If it's too high, I may not be able to read it. Although it has really good contrast and is large, if I can't see that clearly, then I can't read this. And it says, if you come in, please stand behind the marked line while waiting to be served. How could we be doing that better if people can't see? We also saw something else happening where people were rushing to parks and they were standing too close together. So we saw planners coming up with this idea of using circles that they would paint it onto the grass and they had a, a size of a circle and a distance between the circle to keep people safe. I think this was first done in San Francisco. Uh, this is a plan that was shown here in Toronto. Um, but all of these circles are painted on grass. None of the circles were painted on a paved surface. So if you use a wheel mobility uh, device or a, work, a cane or unsteady on your feet, none of this socializing in the park has been planned to include you and your accommodation needs. Again, not hard to do, but you just need to make sure that you're planning for it. And at 22% of the population, I think we could be planning better. We also see that municipal and um, provincial standards often include things about maintenance. So for example, in the AODA, design of public spaces, there's a maintenance section, which means that you have to be trimming your trees to make sure you have a head clearance height so that trees are not uh, brushing into you or uh, touching your head of at least uh, 2,100 millimeters. Um, you'll often see uh, bushes have to be also trimmed back to make sure that preserve the width of the path. Um, and then of course, we were talking about snow earlier. If we're thinking about transportation in our urban environment, we can see that there are several things, if we think about it for a minute, make some sense. We have to consider the path of travel to the bus stops and from the bus stops. We have to help people find the stops as we showed earlier. What about the shelters themselves? Are they actually accessible? Do they have the space for someone with a wheeled mobility device? Or what about parents with, if you're near a school um, or if you're at a community hub, uh, there might, could be lots of parents with strollers as well as people with disabilities with walkers and uh, canes and wheelchairs and scooters. Um, are you planning appropriately for the population? What about the signage you have that identifying the stop itself and any information you're providing such as maps. And then of course, other information that's available. In fact, this is a very common site that we see across Canada and in many places. Uh, this was identified as a hashtag AODA fail, meaning that it doesn't meet the intent and requirements under the AODA, where they have provided a bus stop concrete platform immediately adjacent to the road with a bus stop sign, but it's not connected to a accessible sidewalk. So this was done some time ago um, in 2017, but um, unfortunately we see this far too often. 
Again, this takes some planning and does have some costs associated with it. But again, with 22% of the population already with disabilities and an older rapidly aging population and more than a thousand Canadians a day turning 65, these are the types of accommodations we have to plan for to do this right and keep people safe. Or as we mentioned before, with the weather, we have to be thinking about how do our policies coordinate with um, the needs of people. So here we see a sidewalk that's been carefully shoveled, unfortunately piling snow on both sides, but we have a bus stop that's not cleared. So people who are trying to access the bus at this location would have to climb over the snowbank, across the snow to get onto the bus. So when people with disabilities are looking at this, this is not an accessible form of transportation to them at certain times of the year. Let's quickly touch now on our fourth agenda item, looking accessibility at 15 minute cities. If you're in urban planning, you know all about 15 minute cities. And if you've been paying attention to the news, you've probably heard about it too. This is an idea, um, and we're showing the picture here of the original idea done in Paris, where from any location to your home, what if everything you needed was within a 15 minute walk? So access to groceries, access to the services, access to school or the library. What if we could be getting out of our cars and making it easier for people to get around? We wanna create multi-use high density urban centers. We want to decentralize our surfaces, accessing all essentials within, as I said, a 15 minute distance, polarizing after transition to remote working during COVID-19 has really driven this idea. We've picked, this idea has been picked up by the C40 Mirrors Group. It's a basic rebirth of new urban principles and something that Jane Jacobs was quite famous talking about at length. And of course, it advocates for extending bike infrastructure, public transit, and reducing car traffic. But what are the impacts for all of these things for people with disabilities? One, did we correctly install tactile walking service indicators, also known as Twizzies, to indicate directions using tactile directional indicators, or TDIs? and hazards or change of directions using a tactile attention indicator or TAI. So the picture here shows um, some complicated paths leading to multiple locations, including a tactile map of the site. Here we see an example of ensuring transit is easy to and safe to navigate. And here's the TransLink installation that just happened this past year, which includes tactile surface at the bus stop, as well as tactile and braille signage at all bus stops. This is a significant improvement and something we're seeing discussed in most of the transit projects we're now working on. But bike lanes are a big issue with accessibility. So it's really important. I love biking. We got to get the bikes in a safe place. I often don't bike because I don't feel safe. So the separation of bikes with concrete uh, infrastructure to keep them away from cars is a really good smart idea. Unfortunately, because people aren't thinking about all of the users of the road, this creates often great deal of conflict with people with disabilities. In fact, the BC Human Rights Tribunal just upheld a complaint that the Victoria bike lanes that were just put in discriminate against the blind. If you're thinking about people using rideshare programs, they step off the sidewalk into a rideshare, but if there's a bike lane between them and the cars, how do they get access to that? A blind person can't see when bikes are coming. Bikes often don't stop or don't want to stop and will weave around them. We'll often hear people who, who are blind complaining that they can't hear the hum of the bike or even the bell of the bike so they don't know to be getting out of the way. So the interaction spaces or access to bus stops, how do I get off the curb, cross the bike lane and onto the bus or off the bus are often touch points we need to be addressing better. We also see multi-user paths and uh, use or as a suggested use uh, for a solution. Unfortunately, putting bikes and as you can see in this picture here, somebody using, um, uh, somebody using inline skates uh, you're getting a conflict of users. You're getting people who are traveling at different speeds, who have different comfort levels. Um, and we're often seeing particularly older people uh, getting quite concerned or afraid. So for many mobility devices and assistance, including wheelchair users, mobility scooters, power chairs, guide dogs, et cetera, um, 
It often doesn't provide separate lanes for users according to their speed, and it cannot ensure that cyclists and electric scooters are detectable by sound and sight. So it's a much better idea as we have in many of our cities, a separation of these types of paths rather than a grouping of them. In fact, here we see an article from Bloomberg City Lab that's discussing when street design leaves some people behind. So this isn't just a local problem. It's not just a Canadian problem. This is a problem we're seeing worldwide where people are excited about bike lanes, but because accessibility hasn't been considered, it does not, um, it causes problems because it does not cross the pedestrian or vehicular traffic. It provides plenty of passing spaces. We need to make sure to clear tactile and posted signage. We need to make sure to have safety and maintained and throughout all seasons. It's pretty easy to design for summer perfect conditions, but if, if we were designing for less than perfect conditions, we would be designing better solutions for everyone. So the good news is we now have a new resource. In fact, there is a new update to the OTM Book 18 Cycling Facilities Update I just learned about. And they're gonna be presenting it at the Ontario Bike Summit, or they did present it on December 1st. It's available online for people to look at. And what's exciting is this is the first time I've seen any resource starting to try to address accessibility inclusion. So finally, let's touch on resources. We have free resources in Ontario and in many other uh, uh, municipalities, you'll find uh, free resources like the AODA, Design of Public Spaces. Even if you're not in Ontario, this illustrated technical guide for the design of public spaces includes really good ideas. So if you're looking above and beyond code, how to solve for um, accessibility problems that perhaps your local legislation doesn't include, this tech illustrated guide not only has what the legislation requires in Ontario, but also best practices. The next one is the CSA B651. Now there actually is two different versions of it. So be careful. The dash 12 actually has a release 2014 version. It also has a release 2015 version and the 2018 version uh, just came out. So you want to be careful when you're looking at this or if this is required in a project. Unfortunately, it's not free, but you'll want to make sure to have the right version for the right project. The B651-18 uh, is the latest version and is being harmonized with the National Building Code for the next issuance of that. The CIB or the Canadian National Institute for the Blind has a Clearing Our Path free resource to help, help better address the needs of people who are blind or have low vision. The city of Mississauga, like many Ontario municipalities as a result of the AODA, has put together a facilities accessibility design standard known as FADS. It has a free link available here for you, but again, if you just do a Google search for city of Mississauga, FADS, you'll find this pretty quickly. But they're not the only municipality. There's the um, city of Winnipeg has a standard, the city of uh, uh, Vancouver has a standard, the city of Ottawa has a standard. Uh, wherever you are in Canada, you'll find this. And here's a great uh, free resource from the Center for Universal Design in Australia about complete streets, the healthy agencies uh, play, in role, play a role. Um, and here we talk, they talk quite a bit about both accessibility accommodations and universal design that benefits everyone. In addition to those, I'd love to draw your attention to an organization called 8 to 80 Cities. And they focus a lot on creating cities for all. Lots of great ideas here, lots of consultation with people with disabilities. So definitely something worth checking out. In addition to that, there's an organization called Smart Cities for All, and they've created a Smart Cities for all toolkit, which empowers city leaders and urban planners to make their programs truly smart by being inclusive and accessible by design. So the central question, when you're thinking about policy, when you're thinking about design, I want you to be focusing on who exactly are we designing for? If we're designing only for non-disabled people, we're forgetting and we're making a rookie mistake that designing for the able-bodied only completely forgets that the human experience is a lifetime of changing needs and abilities. So if you're interested in sustainability, there's nothing more resilient or sustainable than accessibility. In fact, if you have an impairment or 
do things in a different way. You often feel like, you know what? I'm not the person with a disability. I'm not disabled. It's my environment that makes me disabled. How much of our environments disable people, often by accident, without thinking about it, and that's unfortunate. In fact, this is a great quote from Neil Milliken, who's an accessibility consultant who focuses on um, the internet and uh, software accessibility. But his quote says, dignity is inextricably linked with respect and acceptance. When we respect the people that we deal with and accept them as equals, dignity is a natural outcome. Finally, let's look at our learning outcomes again. At the conclusion of this session, you should be able to one, identify population demographics of people needing accessibility. Two, recognizing the impacts of the built environment and accessibility legislation on accurately defining the design parameters to include disabled people. Three, integrate inclusive design in public spaces to develop holistic accessibility. And four, recognize the impact of urban planning on the social and economic opportunities for people and the unintended consequences on our society. Thank you so much for watching this. I hope you learned a lot and we really look forward to seeing you in more of the REHC continuing education programs. <laughs> so I see somebody here, uh, Team KAL is saying that this uh, sparked a lot of discussion in the office. Um, Andrea Nicholson uh, asked, have you come across any resources that support accessibility for deaf or deafened and hard of hearing? Yes, yeah, Gallaudet University um, has put together a, now it's somewhat limited, um, but um, a full set of standards uh, called Deaf Space, um, which is actually, if you sign up for the Introduction to Successful Accessible Design course uh, from the REAC, is actually included in that course as a resource uh, to use. Uh, there is not a lot from an urban planning perspective that I think people have uh, thought about or used, uh, but it is something we're starting to talk about, particularly as you saw thinking about bike lanes um, and how quiet bikes can be uh, for somebody like myself who's hard of hearing, I might not hear a bike uh, to be aware that uh, somebody could be coming up um, beside me or behind me fairly quickly, um, but there are uh, more to come. And I think that that's uh, one of the exciting things about accessibility. For all we know, and we do know a lot about it, creating accessible environments, uh, especially in Ontario, where we've had the facility accessibility design standards for the last 20 years. So it's not that our legislation doesn't know what it should be doing, but uh, um, in areas, things uh, like people who are autistic or who um, are deaf or have uh, dementia, there's lots of new research coming online and um, it's exciting times to see what that's gonna look like. So Andrea uh, created a, gave us a link in the chat window here. Thank you so much, Andrea, for the Gallaudet um, Deaf Spaces. Uh, so this is the online version of that standard. Um, it's not the full complete version that we were able to get for the um, REAC course, but that's definitely got some really good ideas and a fabulous video. So hopefully people will find that uh, very useful. Now, as much as we were able to pack into this presentation, and I'm sorry if I overwhelmed you a little bit, but, um, but it was really exciting for me to sort of get to share with you so many of the things that I've come across in the last 20 years. Uh, where we could, we've seen people make mistakes that are avoidable, and once people know that they are a mistake, then hopefully they won't be continuing to make them. Um, but also the, um, you know, the frustration, <laughs> what do I include and what do I not include? So not everything about urban planning is in this presentation, but it was a really, um, we had to sort of think about what were the really important things to try to get to you. There is another presentation, Kevin. Uh, Lynn is asking for another, uh, is there another presentation? It's actually gonna be next Friday on December the 11th. And it, this one is gonna be focusing on accessibility and universal design um, on the site plan. So the site plan is the intersection between urban planning and the building. Um, and many of the things we were talking about today obviously have an impact on what could be or should be happening on your site plan. And how do you do that uh, correctly? When is, <laughs> Kevin Lynn's asking, when is the building version coming? 
Uh, so, so far we don't have a building version um, planned for a webinar. Uh, we did a presentation, two presentations early in the spring. Uh, Designable Environments did one uh, with uh, Bob Topping, who's the president's, um, with uh, David Lepofsky, who's um, an accessibility advocate um, for people with disabilities, who is the chair of the AODA Alliance. And they did a presentation about um, designing for people who are blind and have vision loss. So that was a really cool webinar. And I believe that we have links to that um, as well. I did a presentation about how to do an accessible presentation. So all of the different things, if you're planning or needing to do public consultation or present publicly things that you're doing, uh, but even because of the uh, nature of the AODA employment standard and thinking about holistically, not just public, but staff accessibility, um, all presentations should be to be done um, in an accessible format. Uh, so unfortunately, we were unable to, today to get the Q&A section of this presentation uh, done with the uh, uh, live captioning, but that would be something that normally you would be trying to arrange to do. Uh, I believe the accommodation we're going to be doing for our uh, deaf and deafened participants is to create a transcript of this discussion to send to them afterwards. Uh, which is not a perfect accommodation, but at least an accommodation. Uh, so we, we cover in that presentation how to be doing the presentation itself in an accessible format, things to ask, things to organize. So that's another incredible resource. But if you are interested in the buildings, then the, uh, I will direct you to the Introduction to the Success Successful Accessible Design course, which is a 10-week um, a course uh, that you can get education credits uh, to complete. Um, so probably worth uh, having a look at. Again, if you really understand what I'm talking about or the vision of what a true accessible inclusive design looks like, of course it can't be just one course. Uh, it really has to be an integral part of um, your design experience. You have to be thinking about from the beginning of someone's life to the end of someone's life and all the different types of uh, abilities and disabilities people have over the, that course of their life and whether that's temporary or permanent or situational. Um, there are so many reasons why it just makes so much more sense to make it accessible. Yeah, so Kevin's comment is about minimum, better, and then best. We often run into this when we're dealing with situations where um, accessibility still hasn't come um, full, full on in the project or if we're coming to accessibility a little late in a project is uh, sometimes we have to think about what is the best we can do um, if they didn't include accessibility in the functional program so we don't have the space for it entirely or a space that's uh, more accommodating than code minimum or if they didn't include it in the feasibility study from a budget perspective, so you don't have the money for all of the power door operators that really should be present. Um, how, how do you provide as accommodating an environment as possible? And then when we're working with our clients, we often are talking to the stakeholders, if that's the mistake they've made, how they can be planning and phasing going ahead. So maybe when the building opens, it um, you know, has two elevator shafts roughed in, um, one elevator is installed and the next one they didn't have money to include in the project because that wasn't part of their planning, but the space was allocated. We were able to find the space and then in the next five years, they're planning to install the second elevator. So that's sort of one of the strategies we often help our clients with is how do we plan to make things better depending on when we started on the project. So Andrew Nicholson saying that I work with an accessibility advisor committee and one member often says code is a four letter word for minimum <laughs> because the minimum does not meet the needs of the community. Yeah, not only does the, well, it, it's interesting when we talk about code from a design perspective, I think us as a, in the design community, we all think we're talking about the Ontario building code or if we were talking nationally, the national building code. Um, but the hierarchy of our laws mean we you can't forget the human rights code and from a canadian perspective the human rights code was changed after the canadian charter of rights and freedoms so the human rights code says buildings and spaces shall not discriminate against people with disabilities and uh, to the point of undue hardship meaning that you would have to demonstrate that making it accessible would bankrupt the project so that's 
that's a pretty high standard to reach. So how do we create real equity and inclusion for people with disabilities? And unfortunately, we haven't had the political will or, or the changes needed in, um, you know, Ontario isn't the only province that has an additional accessibility standards. We also have in Manitoba. Um, they're just coming online now in Nova Scotia as well. And um, even these additional AODA or AMA or Nova Scotia Accessibility Act, um, which will be coming soon, um, they may not reach the level of inclusion that the Human Rights Code is asking for. So this is one of the reasons why I push so hard for we really have to fix the building code because the building code is the legally lowest defined limit. So we're not really designing up to code where it's really the lowest limit that's been defined. Um, and in Ontario, the Human Rights Tribunal has published saying that following the building code in the AODA does not um, meet the human rights code level of accessibility and inclusion. So that leaves a lot of people struggling. They have to guess, is this enough? How about this? <laughs> and every project is guessing a little bit differently. So for people with disabilities in the community, uh, every building they go to has a different you know, solution or a different level of accessibility if they are going beyond code minimum. So um, not the best approach, obviously. <laughs> Andrea added, good point about uh, Ontario human rights code. Yeah, that's the thing that a lot of people, I think, don't really understand or appreciate. Uh, there is a liability risk. Oh, you're welcome, Kevin. I'm glad you enjoyed the presentation. I love teaching. <laughs> well, if there are no other questions, we are definitely after two o'clock. So if we want to wrap up there, that would be wonderful. Um, thank you again, Thea, for coming for the live Q&A and for joining us and teaching us. Um, it was greatly appreciated. Terrific. Thank you so much to everybody at the RAAC for helping to organize this and for all the participants who took the time today to attend.